Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third week of lessons on the English Romantic Writer 1798 to 1832. This is Pramod Nair of the University of Hyderabad and the Department of English there. In today's session, the first lesson in this week, we'll be looking at the fiction of the Romantic period. The period is primarily known for its poetry. Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Byron, Sadi, and several others. However, it is also the age in which a certain kind of fiction develops, primarily the Gothic, and several others flourish. So we have a wide variety of genres from this period. The epistolary novel, the romance, the Gothic, the historical novel, the didactic novel, most of which were informed by the idea of sensibility and sentimentalism. Now, if you recall what we have said about the backgrounds to the English Romantic period, sensibility and sentimentality were central to the imagining of other people, other worlds, others' lives. So, sensibility and sentimentalism remained the key modes of engaging with the human. A feeling for the other's suffering was seen as a standard of human distinction. This is informed, of course, by European Romanticism theories of the philosophers such as uh, Adam Smith. We will be looking at some of these uh, as we proceed. The psychology of individuals and the collective psyche or consciousness of society were both examined in many texts. They focused on locality and region, so Ireland, Scotland, England were part of uh, the settings. Then there is a kind of novel that emerges which is primarily interested in the darker side of the human, the darker anxieties, anger, incestuous temperament, murderous rage which constitute the bedrock of the Gothic novel. There was also the political novel influenced by radical and reformist movements of the age and the revolutions and these created preeminently political fiction. But that is a very simplistic division as we will see when we talk about the woman's novel. So, individual psychology, social critique, class, rights were of concern to novelists like William Godwin. Comparable examples with uh, an emphasis on women's rights and exploring issues around domesticity, marriage or social status, class were produced in other genres, most notably in the political novel or the novel of sentiment by Mary Wollstonecraft, Jane Austen and Fanny Burney. Novels such as William Godwin's Caleb Williams, which is a pioneering work, were heavily influenced by the Enlightenment and foregrounded the primacy of reason. However, and that's the important thing. These novels were also interested in the psychology of the individual. So it's not just too easy to say that uh, they are social problem novels or that they were interested only in questions of class and rationality and monarchic power. They were also interested in the individual psychologies. William Godwin, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote fiction heavily influenced by the political ideas and ideals of their time. Godwin had already established himself as a major author and social commentator with his inquiry concerning political justice. Uh, this text was also a key one in terms of exploring the link between law, justice and individual conscience. Here is an extract from Godwin's famous novel, Caleb Williams. I quote, please look up your slide. Strange that men from age to age should consent to hold their lives at the breath of another, merely that each in his turn may have a power of acting the tyrant according to the law. Oh God, give me poverty, shower upon me all the imaginary hardships of human life. I will receive them with thankfulness. Turn me a prey to the wild beasts of the desert, so I be never again the victim of man, dressed in the gore-dripping roles of authority. Suffer me at least to call life, the pursuits of life, my own. Note the tone in which uh, Godwin is writing this passage. Uh, Godwin is not only talking about social inequality and social injustice, but is approaching it via how the individual perceives these. So, the document here is not only one of the social variety, but it's also an exploration of the psychological state of the individual who's trapped in this kind of social injustice. So Godwin uses the distressing social order to actually speak about the individual strategies of coping. That is, he's making the link between the social domain on the one hand, uh, inequality, poor wages, uh, poor working conditions, uh, constant unemployment and the individual strategies of coping which are psychological. So Caleb Williams is one of the first novels to develop this link between the individual and the social order via a perception, our perception of the individual's uh, mental states. Here is a second extract coming up on your slide now from Caleb Williams. I had no power 
of withdrawing my person from a disgustful society in the most cheerful and valuable part of the day, but I soon brought to perfection the art of withdrawing my thoughts and saw and heard the people about me for just as short a time and as seldom as I pleased. Such is man in himself considered, so simple his nature, so few his wants. Uh, what exactly is being said here? You see, uh, if you pay attention to the rhetoric of this passage from Caleb Williams, it's not about the social order alone. What he is talking about, what uh, Godwin is talking about or trying to depict is the individual's psychological condition in responding to the world. And it is an early uh, instance of the psychological novel where you don't just see a person, you see the person's mind working. And uh, Keller Williams is an attempt to document the psychological workings and mechanisms of a particular character. A parallel example from the woman's point of view would appear in Mary Wollstonecraft's work, um, her novel Mary or her uh, tract The Wrongs of Women. The texts here are an exploration of the possibility of emancipation, the social conditions under which women live, and patriarchy. So in um, The Wrongs of Women, Mary Wollstonecraft would ask, was not the world a vast prison and women born slaves? Then she would say, marriage had basil me for life. These questions, statements are radical. In both cases, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft is using the image and metaphor of a prison. Was not the world a vast prison and women born slaves? And then marriage had basiled me for life. Basil, of course, the reference to the famous French prison. In Mary, she would say, in moments of solitary sadness, a gleam of joy would dart across her mind. She thought she was hastening to that world where there is neither marrying nor giving in marriage. These are political statements. Political statements via the psychological conditions of the individual, specifically the individual woman. Critics have argued that such political fiction published in the volatile 1790s in the immediate wake of the uh, American um, War of Independence and the French Revolution, these uh, political texts provided a comprehensive inquiry into the development of a theory of rights, which has long been at the core of the relationship between the individual and the law. Um, if you look at the work of Lynn Hunt, uh, her history of human rights. She'll make the argument that there was the development of the sentimental novel and the psychological novel which provided a foundation to a theory of the human. That is, uh, Lynn Hunt suggests that the idea of human rights proceeds from a, an idea of the human. And the idea of the human emerges in the 1780s and 90s because of a particular portrait of the human, the sentimental creature and an exploration of the psychology of the individual persons. So when you read the sentimental novel, you're actually getting a picture of the entire human. So there is a social context and there is the individual and the workings of the, of the mind, of the consciousness of the individual, the sentimental response of the individual to the world actually give us a complete portrait of the human. In other words, people like Lynn Hunt in The Invention of Human Rights speak about the sentimental novel as a key factor in the rise of the idea of the human itself. Um, other critics such as Tilottama Rajan see such novels as embodying the impossible space between the political and the moral, between the questions of justice and the questions of the ethical. These novels ask, according to people like Rajan, whether the legal and the ethical are the same and whether punishment is a form of justice. It's also a novel about the problems and dilemmas of imprisonment, the operations of the police outside the purview of the legal system, as Quentin Bailey has noted. It's also about the figure of the criminalized victim. And if you pay attention to the 18th century novel uh, by Henry Fielding and others, the, the vandal, the fugitive from justice, and the criminal are key characters. Caleb, the title character of Caleb Williams, who runs away from Falkland's house, is pursued by constables and driven by print media. Uh, and its depictions of him, and the entire London populace is against him. So the novel is therefore about the word, that is the narrative, and the world. It's about the power of the narrative. It's about the power of the narrative to do two things, talk about the world and talk about the consciousness of the individual. So as you can see, we are giving a huge amount of importance to the novels of the Romantic period, um, for contributing to our history of 
say human rights to say the history of the philosophical positions on the human. People like Emily Anderson have argued that when a novel like Caleb Williams ends, uh, he has decided to revenge himself on the tormentor, but the revenge is done in a very interesting way. Please look at your next slide. This is a quote from Caleb Williams. I will use no daggers. I will unfold a tale. I will tell a tale. With this little pen, I defeat all his machinations. That slide is worth reading again. I will use no daggers. I will unfold a tale. I will tell a tale. With this little pen, I defeat all his machinations. What is Caleb Williams doing here? Or what is William Godwin doing here? What he's saying is, the power of the narrative to effect changes in the world, the power of the narrative to effect public opinions in the world. One such category of the novel that alters then and alt alters now, our perception of social order, of class, of rights, of persons and oppression is the woman's novel. That's the genre to which I now turn. Ian Watt, as we all know, famously located Jane Austen as a worthy, the true successor to Samuel Richardson and Henry Fielding. Although there were other women novelists both before and um, around Jane Austen. Recent re-evaluations of the women's novel of this period, however, refused to see them as being concerned solely with women's issues. As people like Nancy Armstrong have argued, to say that these novels are only about the home and the hearth, about children and marriage, which is the basic framework within which the women's novel is, is, is often read, is a rather limiting frame. Jill Campbell, tracing the history of the uh, revaluations of these novels has argued that Jane Austen and the novelists were not apolitical, far from it in fact. They were implicitly addressing, not explicitly but perhaps implicitly addressing the woman's place in the home and thereby exploring the woman's place in the revolution and national governance. This is what Jim Campbell says and I quote from her text. They adapt the novel form to explore questions of women's superior rights and the powers and proper basis of human uh, social and political relations. They explore women's issues such as sexuality and marriage, but they also link these to quest questions of representation, communication and instruction. Mary Wollstonecraft's The Rights of Women, or Maria, sought to link psychology with class and social order. Now, it's unlikely that you can see this, therefore, as solely a novel devoted to women's issues. Why do we say this? We say this because women's issues are not born out of a simple question of marriage. These are born out of larger social prejudices, larger problems in the uneven nature of gender roles, questions of labor, and things like that. That is, it's important to see the rise of the woman's novel less as devoted to the discussion of domesticity as much as a dedication to the exploration of the politics of domesticity. And the minute we say a politics of domesticity, we are actually speaking about the politics of gender and gender roles. Questions of marriage are actually questions of social conventions. In Mary, published in 1788, ten, roughly 10 years before um, the official mark starting of the um, English Romantics, Mary Wollstonecraft would depict a character who sees marriage as confinement. I've already quoted for you the description of marriage as a basil, as a prison. Here, people like Wollstonecraft are not talking women's issues as purely psychological. So it's awkward and inappropriate and severely limiting to say that the woman's novel is only concerned with the hysterical woman or the woman who's given to emotion and sentiment. No, they are actually political novels because they talk about gender roles, questions of wage, and the question of women's rights. So even in texts like Fanny Burney's uh, Evelina, published in 1778, subtitled A Young Girl's Entrance into the World, Burney focused on marriage as a means of respectability. Caroline, the central protagonist of the novel, rejected by Sir John, gives birth to a daughter and dies. Eventually, Evelina, the daughter of Caroline, is accepted by her father and attains social standing. Now, in novels like this, questions of virtue, psychology, are interwoven with questions of sexuality, moral codes, and social norms. These norms are embedded within the larger social context of luxury, class, and social status. What I'm urging you to see is that the exploration of the woman's psychology the exploration of the woman's condition is not restricted to a psychological or sentimental approach. 
it locates the psychology and the sentiment within larger social contexts, such as like class, wealth, and social standing. So we do not wish any longer to see the women's novel as a narrowly defined slim genre. In fact, much of women's fiction from this time is devoted to the politics of gender. Questions of gender roles will also appear differently in the gothic tales of uh, Anne Radcliffe, uh, Clara Reeve and others, but that is not the subject of this particular uh, lesson. Let us turn to our third genre now. As you know, we have now discussed two, the psychological novel, uh, the women's novel and now we turn to the sentimental novel. Sensibility, and this is a reiteration and a recap of what we have said so far, sensibility of the 18th century meant a capacity for refined and sensitive emotional response to the suffering of others. Sentimental literature thus models fine feeling, giving its characters opportunities to exhibit and valorize sympathetic and virtuous emotional expression. So scenes of suffering uh, or strong emotion mark Lawrence turns a sentimental journey or Henry Mackenzie's The Man of Feeling and philosophical texts such as Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments, from which you have the next couple of slides. Please read the first excerpt from Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Look at what he's saying there. Smith is arguing that our senses will never tell us how we feel, how the other person feels. What we need to do, and this is the key portion of the excerpt, they never did and never can carry us beyond our own persons. And it is by the imagination only that we form any conception of what are his sensations, his agonies. Adam Smith is actually speaking about what in the 20th century will be known as the sympathetic imagination, elaborated uh, brilliantly by people like Martha Nussbaum and the fiction of J.M. Kudzier, specifically Elizabeth Costello. Adam Smith is saying, you need to be able to imagine the suffering of the other. I go back to the slide. By the imagination only that we form any conception of what are his sensations. You need to move beyond your person. That is, I move into the other person's shoes, try to explore the other person's sentiments, and that requires a sympathetic imagination. Um, a more detailed elaboration is available in the next excerpt coming up on your slide now, also from Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments. As a person who is principally interested in any event is pleased with our sympathy and hurt by the want of it, so we too seem to be pleased when we are able to sympathize with him and to be hurt when we are unable to do so. This is moral sentiment defined. To be able to sympathize with the suffering other, to be able to sympathize with a person's suffering is to constitute ourselves as human and the other person as a human deserving of our attention. We are humans because we respond. We are humans because we respond in particular ways. So if you look at this passage in particular, we see several references to the idea of sympathetic response or sympathetic pain, sympathetic joy. Uh, our sense of the world is primarily constituted by subjectivity. But Adam Smith is saying our subjectivity has to be intersubjective between us and the other. So Think about this. This is a radical departure from the traditional way of looking at the English Romantics. To recap briefly and quickly, we have thought that the English Romantics were concerned only with themselves. But as you can see from quotes like Adam Smith's here, our job is to also relate to the other. I am myself because I respond to the other. And if you recall what you have said about abolitionist poetry, we have been called upon to respond to the suffering of the slaves. We as English have to respond to the slaves and from there will emerge the anti-slavery campaign. This is the argument made by the abolitionists, Hannah Moore's poetry, Robert Sadi's poetry and several others like William Wilberforce. That is, a sentimental response to the slave is the foundation for seeing the slave as a human. Anna Vieda Rowland uh, cites an instance from Ola the Equiano's fascinating um, narrative, the interesting narrative of the uh, life of Ola the Equiano, 1789, that relied on sentimental structures to communicate suffering. This is Equiano's, um, shall we say, call to the English. Oh, yea, and this is right up there on your slide now. Please read it. Oh, yea, nominal Christians. Might not an African ask you, learned you this from your God who says unto you, do unto all men as you would men should do unto you? 
Is it not enough that we are torn from our country and friends to toil for your luxury and lust of gain? Must every tender feeling be likewise sacrificed to your avarice? It concludes by speaking about the fresh horrors to the wretchedness of slavery. But look at the key point. Must every tender feeling be sacrificed to your avarice? This is Equiano, the black man, asking the white man, should we sacrifice our sentiment for your greed? We see several such instances in Murray Edwards, The Grateful Negro, uh, where the black slave is characterized as having some kind of sentiment. Now, the point to remember here is the sentimental novel, the woman's novel, and the psychological novel are not watertight compartments, but all of them are political. As we conclude the lesson, I would urge you to therefore rethink how we have traditionally read the English romantic text. They are not texts devoted to only sentiment and psychology. They locate sentiment and psychology in larger social relations, questions of labor, questions of wage. Now, this is obviously a slightly left reading of the English romantics. But the point is that none of these texts are explicitly apolitical. They may not be explicitly political, but a careful reading of any of these texts will show us that for people like uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, David William Godwin and others, these novels and their characters are actually critiquing social relations. So the fiction of the romantic period, and we'll be looking at some specific genres over the next few sessions, are actually political texts. Thank you.